laugh and decelerate here. Here to help those of you who have felt pressure to sign up for this Accelerate program. Why would you accelerate? When you're on the highway and there's a police officer in your rearview mirror, do you accelerate? No, you decelerate. You don't want a ticket, neither do I. Captain Decelerate's here to help you decelerate. Why create more pressure? Why raise your blood pressure? So rather than develop a savings plan, Captain Decelerate has an alternative program in my manual, Decelerate. And it's in comic book form with me, Captain Decelerate, as the hero. Soon to have action figures, hoping to cut a deal with, uh, you know, Mattel and also with the Avengers. They're signing even ant people up now. I hope they get me on board. Anyway, I hope you can sign up for my program, Captain Decelerate. You don't have to cut up all your credit cards on my program. Just cut up the ones you don't like. You know, there's all Kmart and uh, Sears and uh, Diners Club. Keep your Visa and your MasterCard. Those might come in handy if you ever have, you know, uh, an emergency. <laughs> Captain Decelerate here. So, hope you can get signed up. Hope you're available. Hope you don't get sucked into this Accelerate thing. Slow it down. We're not pole vaulters. We're not high jumpers. Why raise the bar when you can lower the bar? Thank you. I thought we might need a good laugh this morning. What do you think? especially this morning as we're going to dive into a new series. But before we dive into that, I want you to know this new series is actually fairly connected to the one we just finished. If you've been part of our community at all over the last five weeks, you know that what we have said is that this bridge represents a journey. And on one side, here we are, and it's us wanting what God wants for our life. And on the other side is God's dream for our life. And what we said is, is to have God's dream in our life, we've got to take across this bridge a journey. But as we travel this journey, as we do it, there are things we said in our life that if we let them control us, will actually kill God's dreams. And so over that five-week series, we looked at things like trying to have God's dreams on our terms. That doesn't work. It kills it. Or when we're impatient people, or people that live from fear, or we are people that procrastinate, or we surround ourselves as people with the wrong people. It will kill God's dreams. But this morning, as we dive into this new series, what we're going to talk about is another issue that sort of underlies all of those other five that comes into play many, many times, and that the reality of it is, even in Loudoun County, Virginia, there is a normal that needs to be changed, because if we don't change this normal, it will also kill God's dreams for our life and keep us from accelerating. And so if you were here maybe eight or nine weeks ago, one particular Sunday, you would have walked in and as you got handed your weekly bulletin and handout, as well, you were given a white envelope. Some of you might remember that. And it said very specifically, do not open until you're told. I've never seen so many people with impulse control problems when they receive that envelope. But when you opened it up during the service, inside was some instructions and three $1 bills. And we said, hey, here's the deal. We want you over the next three minutes to go find some people and try to give away as much as you can. And it was amazing to watch people have fun when it came with finances. Some of you, though, since that happened, I've noticed that every Sunday when you walk in, you look for another envelope. <laughs> Doesn't always happen that way. But we heard some words back from that exercise that you don't normally hear when it comes to this issue. We heard people say like, wow, I felt free or at peace. When reality is the normal when it comes to financial situations is that we don't feel free. We feel bondage. We feel anxiety. We feel like we're sort of strapped into this way of living. And we said this, that normal in Loudoun County, in Fairfax County, in North Virginia, looks a whole lot like that. We can actually expect normal for financial situations to be anxiety-ridden, it can be bondage-like, just as much we can expect that this year, again, the Browns are not going to make the Super Bowl. It's just how it works in my life. And so when we looked at that idea, we asked ourselves, what if we tried to change that which is normal and create a new normal? One of the passions for our church is to be a spirit-directed church. You see it everywhere. Discipling people to know Jesus as Lord. And we know that when we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that on the other side of the bridge sometimes... As we take that journey to get God's dreams on that other side, it requires us to step out in faith to get there. And many times what we discovered was that there were people hearing from God, this is how I should live, but they weren't willing to take that step because they found themselves when it came to this financial situation to be in a bit of bondage. So as a church, we have been going on this accelerate journey together. Now, 
currently we had about 450 adults sign up and about 100 kids are going through generation change, which is specifically from middle school and high school. And so as we did that, we did that to help people learn what it looks like to live their life by the stewardship of God's ways of doing things. And I know some of you are like, this is the strangest Mother's Day sermon of all time. Just bear with me, right? We realize that there are so many things that God our Father wanted for us, like we as good parents would want for our kids, that many people weren't living from because they were slaves in this area of finances. And this isn't about just getting money for the church. Too often, when we talk about finances in the church, it seems like a backdoor, a shakedown to give money to the church. No, we want you to have the dreams that God has for you, and we wanna do our part to release the bondage that many of us walk under. So what's interesting is, as we took these 450 adults through this program, they're still going through right now, called Financial Peace University, one of the early weeks, we asked people if they would be willing, there's no requirement to do this, to just anonymously on a piece of paper, write down how much non-house debt that they're carrying in their life. Here's the idea, that we feel like that too often we carry so much debt around us that if Jesus asks us to step out in faith, we feel fearful to do it because of the debt. Now, we're not exactly sure how many people responded. We had about 180 or so units, which means it could be single or adults. We think it's about 300 or so people that responded. So clearly not everyone responded. It's okay. We didn't need it. We were just trying to find out if what we felt to be true, if what anecdotal research told us was true, was actually true about the people that we know and live. And this was the number that those 300 people turned in. Six million, nine thousand dollars in non-secured debt. Do you think it's hard to live out what God wants us to live when the average person's carrying roughly twenty thousand dollars in extra bondage and baggage? I think it is. And so what we wanted to do and help us all is to understand that God has a plan for everything in our life, even in those things that we don't like to talk about in church, and that is finances. The only thing that'll make it more complicated in church to talk about finances, if we start talking about politics, right? <laughs> it gets icky. And so we're trying to help many of us walk through this. And you might look at this and say, oh, well, whew, I'm not part of that. that that's okay. What I'm trying to help us understand is this, is that God's dreams often get derailed when we follow culture's plans. And there's a different way of doing things. But what if this morning, if we thought freedom in this idea was just about getting out of debt, I would suggest we are missing something because it's possible to actually release the debt burden from our life and to still not accelerate into God's dreams for our life because we haven't actually changed our mindset. And more importantly than changing our debt ledger is changing our mindset about God, how he asks us to live and to be. Now, I got a picture right here of a friend of mine. It's Michael Dorsey. I knew him from college, but after, he was a contestant on The Biggest Loser. He uses this picture often as he talks. In fact, I've invited him to come speak at our men's breakfast a time or so, as well as he's spoken here on a Sunday morning. He was the 14th season of Biggest Loser. At the time, he was the largest competitor that ever got on the show, and he lost over 140-some-odd pounds. Amazing transformation. But what he will tell you is there's a whole lot of things going on in the background that they don't show on the show. And one specific thing that they focus a lot on in the background isn't just whether or not you are gonna get rid of some of the debt baggage of weight that you have, is whether or not you're actually gonna change your mindset about it. Because the percentage of people that leave the biggest loser and in a short period of time actually gain back that weight and more is way over 50%. And you think to yourself, that's crazy. Why would they do all of that work and do that? To which I submit, why do we many times find ourselves putting ourselves in a good position and then five years later, we're like, how did I wind up back here? I submit it's because we have not changed our mindset. And this morning, we're gonna grapple with a word that is key to changing our mindset. And it's the word called contentment. 
Can we be a people that understands and lives from contentment? And to see that, I invite you to open your Bibles this morning. We're gonna be in the book of Philippians chapter four. If you need a copy of scripture, just raise your hand or you can pull up a digital device, grab our app, hit notes on the front page of our app and boom, it'll pull everything up you need right there for you. But as we dive into Philippians chapter four this morning, what we're gonna need to understand is that to actually accelerate and not decelerate as Captain Decelerate would want us to do, we need to trust God completely. And trust is deeply interweaved with this idea of contentment. In fact, the lack of contentment, just like the lack of patience or the wrong people or fear or many other things that we've talked about already, it will actually kill God's dreams for our life. So if you're there, this is what it says. This is the Apostle Paul writing now from a different place, Rome, to the church at Philippi, saying this in Philippians chapter four, starting in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. God, today, may we understand that doing that, what you've called us to do to live out that dream, comes from you and you alone in your strength. And as we deal with maybe some myths that we're believing, may, we, may they be exposed to the truth and may we change. In Jesus' name, amen. So we need to start when we're talking about trying to find contentment and understanding what contentment really is for us. Because depending on what time of your life that you might be in, contentment kind of looks a little bit different for us. We might define it different at one stage of life than others. Like for example, if you have young kids right now and you're a mom, contentment may just be five minutes to yourself with a cup of coffee without someone going, mom, 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 mom. I recently read this on social media. It was by a young mom and this is what she wrote. Before kids, a bathroom was just a bathroom. Now it's my Narnia. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you, if you have young kids, you know, you go to the bathroom and you're in the bathroom and they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What do you think I'm doing? Like you look down and the kid's hand is right there underneath the door. <laughs> doing that last hour, I literally saw a parent of someone who's now 20 some year old sitting next to him, look at them and went, you did that. So contentment looks a little bit different to us at certain times. So we need to have a general definition we can all agree on. And, and here's contentment in a nutshell. Contentment means sufficiency independent of external circumstances. It means no matter what's going on outside of me, I can still feel sufficient. Gary Thomas, an author, just used this term. Contentment just means soul rest. Now our soul, remember, it's our, it's our thoughts, it's our emotions, it's our will. It means that my thoughts aren't anxious and they're at rest. My heart isn't burning all the time with, with difficult things and, and I'm at rest no matter what the circumstances are around me. I don't have feet that all of a sudden get really antsy and need to move, that, that I'm willing to wait and I can, I can be at rest in every situation that we have in our life. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good, right? How many of you would like soul rest in your life? So it's not a trick question. Some of you, like, I've not been paying attention. What have you been saying? I think we all want soul rest, right? <laughs> we want that moment with despite whatever's going on around us, our mind, our hearts, our feet, they're, they're at rest, they're content. I would even submit to say that all of us actually, whether we knowingly or unknowingly, seek some sense of contentment. We seek some sense of rest, the problem often is, though, in the middle of that seeking is we seek it from the wrong places. And so what Paul wants to do is he wants to show us there are some myths and a truth. And that where we go to get contentment will really affect the life that Jesus wants us to have. And so he begins by saying, look, this is a myth. Here's the first one. A myth is that my situation provides my contentment. 
He says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. The situation is different each time, right? Have you ever just thought this? If I could just move out of this house in this neighborhood and move into a different house in a different neighborhood, I would be content. I'd be at rest. Or maybe you just thought to yourself, hey, if my children just grow up and they, uh, they turn out to be just good parts of society, then I will have contentment or rest. How about this one? How many here at one point or another have thought to themselves, if I could just change my job, I would have contentment or rest. Let me see your hands. People are honest about that, right? Right, some of you. Now, I'm keeping my hand up. <laughs> because this is true in my life sometimes. Now, I don't say that to scare anyone, but do you know that the number one day of the week for pastoral search firms to get hit on their website and general job placement about churches get hits on their website. You know what day that is? Monday. That's exactly right. Why? Well, here's how it works. Something happens on Sunday that goes bad. Or something doesn't happen on Sunday that the pastor might want or respect, right? They make someone angry or they don't make someone happy. And without even trying, what happens is they begin to fall into that. So they go home and they think to themselves, well, let me just take a nap. That, by the way, that's part of a pastoral routine. We take naps on Sunday, right? That's why I don't answer your call if you call me between two and three, all right? And so uh, don't test me, Cindy. I know you're gonna call me today between two and three. I'm just gonna hit ignore, right? So between two and three. And you think to yourself something like this, well, maybe when I wake up, the feeling will be gone. And you wake up, and guess what? The feeling's not gone. And you go throughout the day, and you wake up on Monday morning, and without even trying, though you can teach words from Philippians from chapter four, you can't necessarily live from them. Now, I know some of you, some are like, Brian, take the other job. No, that's not what this is about. <laughs> This is about understanding the myth that just because I could try to change a job or you could try to change a job or just because you could try to change your home situation or your kid's situation, that isn't where true contentment comes from. Because even as we look at the situation with our kids and we say, well, it goes from I will just be content if they grow up and they're good acting people in society. You say then later on, well, now that they've grown up, I'd be just content if they would call me every once in a while. Know what I'm saying? It, it is a, a moving target. When we begin to think situations would make us okay, it is the situational wanderlust of life. If this situation was just this way, that's why it blows me away, Paul in Philippians. And a lot of you know this already, but Paul was writing the book of Philippians from a prison in Rome to the church at Philippi. He wasn't in Philippi when he was writing this. 80, 60 to 62, three to four years, he was in prison. I mean, it, it's crazy when you think about this. I mean, American prisons are not great places, but if you really want to think of worse prisons, try to think of Roman prisons. And here he is writing, saying, you know what? I'm content. I, I know what it's like to, to be in want and to be in plenty. Because if you remember his life before this, he had all kinds of political power as a Pharisee. He most likely had financial good situations. Yet in both of those situations, he understood that where he would get his soul rest from did not come from those, but it came from somewhere else. Most of us in this room live in either Loudoun County or Fairfax County. Both of those counties are in the top five most affluent counties in the nation, right? How do you think Loudoun County and Fairfax County is doing with soul rest? I think Captain Decelerate should be our new hero. Because there's a whole lot of people that aren't getting soul rest for being in a situation that Money Magazine would say that Loudoun County is one of the top three places to live. You would think if you could find contentment through a situation, it might be in Loudoun County. Some of you say, no, I've been to San Diego. That's where I want to go. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It is not about our situation and so when we seek to find contentment from a situational scenario, we will always find ourselves lacking. 
And so what happens next is that when it doesn't necessarily happen by a situation, we often go to this next myth that our stuff provides contentment. All right, if it's not a situation, stuff. But that's what, that's what Paul says. I've learned whether living in plenty or in want that I can be content. Did you know that we live in the most marketed culture in all of human history? Today and today alone, if we are the average American, we will be exposed to a minimum of 1,000 pieces of advertising trying to get your attention for their product. Did you know that the average kid, by the time that they are 20 years old, will see over 1 million commercials through television, YouTube, or some other place. Why? For the very point to get us to think that what we want is actually what we need. Now, there's nothing want, wrong with wanting something. What happens, though, is when it moves this idea from I want to I need it, and then all of a sudden what we begin to think is, ah, if I could just get this then I will be content. That's why I need that. And I submit to you to prove this idea. Amazon Prime. <laughs> now, I know there's at least one person in this room right now that works for Amazon. Uh, I, I'm gonna show you something. It was amazing last hour. I need you to work with me on this. If you or your family have a subscription to Amazon Prime, I want you to raise your hand and hold it up. Look around, folks. It was like, holy cow, I thought was the only one. No, Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world. You are not the only one. Okay, keep him up. No, I'm gonna keep him up just for a second. Amazon Prime is the greatest example of helping us move from the idea that we want something to the idea of convenience that we need something, right? I was out there uh, just the other day. Um, actually, it was yesterday. I was out on my porch and um, I've got a rose bush out there that I need to trim. And I realized something, that I have a set of hand trimmers, but they're a little bit dull. And so I could go get them sharpened or use the dull ones, but you know what I thought? Why would I need to do that when I have Amazon on my phone? <laughs> and I looked Amazon up, and all of a sudden, I mean, did I really need trimmers? No. But I realized that for $6.99, I could have them delivered to my house in two days. <laughs> know what I'm saying? I mean, they have marketed so well, we think that we deserve everything on the planet to come to our house in two days. And when it doesn't, we get upset. The other day, um, we took our cat, who is a very big cat. He's, he's 22 pounds, and he's not very graceful, to the vet. We took him to the vet because he's so big and he's not very graceful. He jumped off something. and We thought he had broken something. In fact, he had just sprained something. So it cost me a whole lot of money to go to the vet to tell us, no, he just sprained something, but you are really bad pet parents. Your cat is way overweight. <laughs> and so what the, what the uh, veterinarian does, he says, I'm gonna recommend this special cat food, which cost about the same per ounce as gold does, and I'm gonna have you order it so that your cat doesn't die from overweight, diabetes, or whatever it else may be. Look, folks, you have to understand, I'm from the Midwest. The solution to a fat cat isn't expensive cat food. It was a new cat where I grew up from, okay? <laughs> so all of a sudden, I find myself having to order this expensive cat food from someplace other than Amazon. And it took five days to get to my house. And at day two, I looked at Kathy and I said, this is why Amazon's putting everyone out of business. I can't believe it takes five days. Do they have to make this cat food? It's just gonna come there. All of a sudden, I was impatient. Look, that cat had been overweight for five years and now I couldn't wait five days. <laughs> why? Because they had successfully marketed to me this idea and it moved from something that I want to I need to I deserve. And when we get that mindset that we deserve something that really is a want, what happens is we begin to circumvent God's way of living life. We become impatient and we make decisions outside of God's ways. It is the reason that the average American in the United States has $15,000 in credit card debt. 
It's a reason that in a survey in 2017, CNBC noted this, that 32% of the people between 53 and 62 in that survey, so 32% between 14 and a half years and five years or so from retirement, according to Social Security for Retirement, had saved absolutely nothing for retirement. Why is that so? It's because we are people that too often think not only can situations give us contentment, but if situations can't get us contentment, stuff can't get contentment, and we've a whole, spent a whole lot of money in retail therapy trying to get that to do what only what Paul is trying to tell us can come from some other place. This, in fact, is Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Do you know who wrote that? The Jeff Bezos of his day, the richest man on the planet, King Solomon. If there's anyone who should say, look, it is not about peace and contentment, about what's actually in your bank account. It's about something else. He is qualified to say that, just like Paul had to learn that. And I had to learn that. One of the reasons that we started beginning looking at this idea of dealing with our finances is that we recognize that about 70% of the people who, who come into our offices here at Christian Fellowship Church for some sort of counseling, the issue is either rooted or exasperated by a wrong understanding of finances and what God means for us to do with them. But I think we could think that that always has something to do with they were deeply in debt. It's no, my wife and I can tell you, if you asked her right now, what is the number one thing that we have argued at and about over our time together. We've married 17 years, 19 years we've been together. On three, we'll say it together. Ready, Kathy? One, two, three. Money. She said clothes. No, I'm just kidding. Money. <laughs> Money. Why? Because there was not for both of us a mindset change. See, here's the point. We actually weren't in debt. Didn't know anything else but on our house. But the way that we thought about money and the way that was broken in the way of God's way of thinking such that when my wife thought about money, it taught this idea of freedom. If I have a lot of money in the bank account, I have freedom. The problem is freedom only comes from who? Jesus. I thought if I have a lot of money in the bank account, then I can have security. Only one problem. You know who's the only one who gives security? Same answer as freedom. Jesus. So catch this. Imagine what happens when I start to cramp down on my security and it threatens her freedom. Imagine what happens when she starts to express her freedom and it would clamp down on my security. I would suggest you would not want to have been around us at the time. We had finances figured out, but what we did not have was peace. Peace. You see, this isn't just about making sure we get our checkbook and our ledger set. This is about a whole changing of mindset that we need to learn about where we get soul rest and contentment from and the lies that culture wants to tell us that they tell us it'll come from some other place when it will only come from what Paul is gonna say in verse 13. But even Paul himself had to learn this. Verse 12, he says this, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He's saying, look, it doesn't come natural. It's something that we have to learn because we will be people that will go out and we will look for situations. We will look for stuff to do what it cannot do. King Solomon said it won't happen. Paul said it doesn't happen from there. In fact, what Paul says is this, that we must learn the truth about this reality, that Jesus is the true source of contentment. He said, I have learned whatever situation that I'm in, that through Christ, through him, I can do all things. See, we look at verse 13 often and we think, oh, through Christ, I can accomplish this goal, accomplish this goal, or accomplish this goal. In fact, one of the very significant applications is this, is that only through Christ will we have contentment. Trying to seek or find it any other way will only be a problem. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't use finances as an instrument to bring about contentment. But it means we get it all messed up when we begin to worship the instrument more than the giver of the instrument. He says, understand, look, this comes from me and me alone. And many times God does use finances in our life to help us. In fact, in this situation, why Paul is writing the letter back to the people at Philippi is they had sent him, even in their loss, even their uh, poverty, they had sent him a pretty nice gift. And he's saying thank you. 
But what he's also saying when he says thank you is that whether you would have sent this gift to me or not, I'm not being ungrateful, that I still would have soul rest because my soul rest, my contentment does not come from what you gave me. My soul rest comes from the one who created all that we can give. But we gotta learn that. And it's hard. But what we need to understand that Paul eventually got to this point by making some hard choices. He learned that. And so for each and every single one of us, depending on where we are in this journey, where we are in crossing that bridge, God having the dreams for us, if the financial situation is real in our life or the financial situation used to be real in our life or we think it might be one where we have to think about in the future where we're trying to get contentment from the wrong places, there are three things very specifically that we must learn in order to have Soul rest. And this is what they are. Here's the first one. Trust God's ways instead of cultures. There's a whole lot of Captain Decelerate culture out there that talks about don't raise the bar, lower the bar. Don't live by God's ways through his word of saying this is how you should conduct your life. But live by this idea that if you want it, then you actually need it, and if you need it, you actually deserve it. Ever been through Walmart, Target, pick your store, whatever, and you've heard a three-year-old saying, yeah, but I need it. It's funny until you realize they got it from us. As we pick up our Amazon Prime and we go, yeah, but I need it. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with wanting something. It's when we misunderstand and begin to think that that what we want, whether it's a situation or stuff, is something that we actually need, but that need will provide contentment. It only comes from Jesus. What happens in those moments in our life when we're struggling with contentment, we're struggling with peace? Where do we turn for soul rest? Do we turn? Do we turn to God and God's word and God's spirit in us, or do we turn to retail therapy? A return to fantasizing about a different job or a different situation. But not only do we need to trust God's ways instead of culture, here's the second one. We need to actually learn this idea of how to be grateful for what we have. Even the least of the least of the least of those who live in Loudoun County. I would like to submit, I'm guessing this number, but I feel really confident in it. There's more than one billion people on this planet that would be happy to change positions with that position here. I know this because I've been in other places in the world. And many of you have as well. But it's really easy to begin to play the comparison game, especially here in Loudoun County, and to forget to what it means to be grateful about what we already do have. Have you ever felt really good about where you are or what you're doing, but then all of a sudden see someone else who might be around your same age or the, you know, you went to college with them? My 25th graduation anniversary is this year. And so a lot of the pictures are coming out on Facebook from friends like, hey, remember we were this young and skinny? No, I'm old now. But, you know, um, and, and I look at some of the things that they do and the, and the amazing things that are happening in their life. And if I'm not careful, I can move from being content with what God has done through me and think, oh, well, what if I did that? What if I had done that? What if I made that decision? You ever been that way? I mean, you're really cool with your car till your neighbor gets a new one. You're really fine with, with the career choice you made until all of a sudden this person's career choice brings about this. This idea of being grateful for what we have has to be embedded in order to have contentment. And I have to tell you, I, I'm convicted in my own life when I think about the fact of how God has so richly and ultimately blessed me when I have moments of comparison and I think I don't have all that I need. Here's the third one. We have to be willing to be the instrument, not just the receiver. Here's what I mean by that. The church at Philippi were willing to help Paul even when they themselves needed help. And being the instrument allows God to use us to bless others. But if we choose or don't choose to be the instrument, it will reveal whether or not we trust or don't really trust God that much in the way he cares for us. And, and this is what I mean by this. 
you've been here at all, part of our church, a fairly common thing that I remind us of from the book of Romans chapter eight is this, that if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're the son or the daughter of the almighty God who perfectly loves us, unconditionally accepts us and always protects us. So I neither have to fear nor perform, right? So I'm a son of God. If you have a relationship with him, you're a son of God. Or you're a daughter of God. That's how it works. Now imagine, for example, that it's really, really clear in one of our minds, it's not debatable, that God has asked us to do something to help another brother and sister in Jesus Christ. But when God asks us to step out and do that, we feel really a lot of tension because the belief is that if I do that, somehow I am gonna be at a loss or I'm gonna lose something or I'm gonna be in a bad situation. You ever felt that tension before? Here's the catch though. God is a good father. How many of us as good parents would actually hurt one kid to help another? Any of us knowingly, willingly do this? I would say no. And see, since God knows everything, what we would have to be saying in that moment is simply this, that God, it's clear you want me to do this, but I'm not gonna do this because I believe that if I do this to help another brother or sister out and be the instrument, it's going to hurt me. God, you're gonna hurt me to help someone else. That's not how it works. And it happens. Imagine, Josh, that it was very clear that God said to me, uh, give Josh $1,000. Now, Josh, we're good friends. He did not say that, uh, Josh. He, he, didn't, he didn't say that at all. Uh, but say he did, right? Say he did. If he said that, give you a thousand, and I was like, well, I mean, I, I like Josh. He, he's, he's a nice guy. We hang out, but like if I, if I do this for Josh, God, you're gonna hose me over. Hose, by the way, is Hebrew, if you didn't know that. <laughs> what does that mean about my trust in God? It means that I don't trust him as much as I should. I really don't believe he is my heavenly father who perfectly loves me, unconditionally sets me, and always protects me, so I neither have to fear nor Perform. Our willingness to be the instrument, not just the receiver, deeply is part of learning what it means to have soul rest and to be content. You can't be the instrument to help others. You can't reach out like we're trying to do at Christian Fellowship Church or at the neighborhood that you are living in. You can't do that if you aren't convinced that God is the source of your contentment. If you think it's stuff or situations, we're like, ah, I can't do that because it threatens my stuff or it threatens my situation. You see, the world is not actually teaching soul rest. There are a bunch of Captain Decelerates out there telling us, ah, don't worry about that, lower the bar, when in fact, what Jesus wants for us is actually soul rest. He wants for us to learn what it's like to trust in him and live by his ways and do things that way. I, I do ask this question. If you were a parent or you are a parent, how many of us here want contentment, want soul rest for our kids? Now let me ask you this. What makes you think God wants not that for us? If we as imperfect people want soul rest and contentment for our own children, how much more would the God of the universe who's the creator of soul rest and contentment want it for you and for me, the ones he sent Jesus to die for. The question is whether or not we'll choose to follow that way and to live that life. And so this morning, I recognize this may be the weirdest Mother's Day sermon that you've ever heard. <laughs> but don't you want contentment maybe for your kids? Perfect parent wants it for you too. And he wants us to know it only comes through one way. Not through stuff, not through situations, but through a change of a mindset that says that he is the source of contentment. So that when he asks us to step from one side to the next, we can do it and accelerate into his dreams for us. God, Thank you for your word and your truth. May we now, through your spirit, live from that word and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>